in the space of a few short decades, we have completely changed the way the, the world produces food, primarily through the Green Revolution and its legacy. We focused on uniformity. We allowed the world to become more homogenized in the way we, food, we farm and the food that we, we eat and, and process. But we are starting to see the consequences of that uniformity. In writing Eating to Extinction, I wanted to go as far back as I could in our food story as, as humans. So in 2017, I was lucky enough to travel to East Africa, uh, where I spent some time with members of the Hadza uh, tribe, who are some of Africa's last hunter-gatherers. As humans, the most, our, our most successful lifestyle to date has been as... Has been as hunter-gatherers. So if you think two million years of uh, bipedal humans, our human ancestors, walking on uh, two legs, uh, hunting, foraging, and approximately 10, 12,000 years of agriculture. So we're still through a bit of an experiment, really, when it comes to the long sweep of human history. One, one thing to bear in mind is that in this population of, of 1,000, only 200 now practice no form of, of agriculture. But the, the 200 that do are so intimate with the biodiversity of where they are uh, that through the seasons, they um, have a, a potential menu of 800 different plant and animal species. So just hold that thought and just think about your own diet and how much diversity you encounter through the year. Um, one of the stories, or the story that I became obsessed with uh, when I was in Tanzania was the relationship between the Hadza and this quite modest-looking bird, the honey guide, uh, scientific name indicator, indicator. And the, the um, Hadza, their number one favorite food is honey. Uh, so anthropologists have spent decades researching the Hadza. Um, it's high energy because it has wriggling larvae and bees caught in the sticky, delicious gooiness. Uh, it's high protein as well, but um, the, um, all the survey data comes back to say this is the number one favorite food. But it's high cost in the, um, to find a bee's nest in the savannah, high up in a baobab tree, could take a hunter-gatherer hours and hours of, of time looking for the, that, that, um, that sweet food. But we think over, well, possibly 700,000 years since humans really had control of fire and use of smoke, that there's been this trade-off between the humans and the bird. And what I saw was the Hadza hunters going out into the savannah, whistling a particular tune, which would then, hopefully, attract a honey guide bird who would then respond by leading the hunter-gatherer to a tree where there was honey. The hunter-gatherer would then go up the tree and with smoke, make it a, safe, um, a safer way in which the honey could be extracted and would then leave behind some of the wax and the wriggling larvae for the uh, honey guide birds to enjoy. So we think that relationship, that conversation between humans and birds dates back around 700,000 years at least back to that time of humans controlling fire. But this conversation could be um, on the brink of extinction. It could disappear within our lifetimes after those hundreds of thousands of years because the, the Hadza are at a pinch point now because there are uh, farmers encroaching on their land. Um, there is a land grab that's taken place in, in parts of the, the uh, region where they are. And also, when I was there... Uh, recording a radio program, there was a, a hut just on the fringes of where they um, uh, live, and uh, some of the most uh, famous soft drinks brands in the world had somehow managed to get to this mud hut, and so one source of sweetness was being replaced by another. So again, that, co that, uh, that ancient conversation um, could be on the brink of extinction. So following on from that um, 
deep dive into our earliest history. So the first section of the book does talk about wild foods from different parts of the world. And then in the second section, I talk about that transition that was made by our ancestors, again, 12,000 years ago, where in this part of the world, so the Fertile Crescent, which covers, as you can see, many of the countries uh, in this region, Syria, southeastern Turkey, Iraq, Iran. So hunter-gatherers here 12,000 years ago were interacting with wild grasses and through selection, in some cases conscious, in some cases unconscious, they uh, selected and domesticated those wild grasses to give us the, the, the wheat and the barley um, that provides the world with many of its calories or ingredients for other, other foods. So I wanted to understand why does this history matter? Why do these... This is, a, in the parlance of some botanists, a centre of origin. This is a region in which some of the world's most important foods originated. And I went to southeastern Turkey to try and find out what kind of diversity exists there today. And I was lucky enough to meet communities of farmers who were still growing one of the ancient types of wheat that were, were, were the, um, date back to that early period of domestication. It, and when the earliest farmers selected from the wild grasses, the wild wheats, um, there was iron corn and there was emma. Emma is the wheat that the people who built the pyramids were farming and eating. The people who erected Stonehenge were, would have been uh, farmers of emma wheat. And in this part of Turkey that I travelled to, they were still growing emma. So it's possible they were 8,000 seasons in to um, selecting emma. And for them, it was, it, they had a very deep connection with this wheat. They talked about their love of how it looked in the fields, how it tasted. To them, it was more than food. It was identity, tradition, their inheritance. For them, it was also medicine. They, you know, they, they believed that this was a, a, an extremely important food, not just for the health of the soil, but also for their own health as well. The reason why that matters of that story from the Fertile Crescent to these farmers 8,000 years later growing Emma is that the crops spread out from the Fertile Crescent and were sent around the world, literally by farmers who carried the seeds planted them, and then over time, because they saved the seeds, because those seeds were then given the opportunity to adapt to the a changing environment, different soils, different cultural preferences, huge amounts of diversity in this one crop was created. And so, buried deep into the Arctic, down a tunnel is Svalbard. Um, the seed vault that is the backup for seed banks around the world. So it's very hard to have a sense of how much diversity there is in the food system, how much has been created over millennia by farmers. Svalbard provides us with a clue. So if you think about some of the wheats that spread out from the Fertile Crescent that then adapted and evolved in different parts of the world, were then sent back by seed collectors and botanists and stored away in Svalbard, you now have more than 200,000 unique accessions of wheat alone. Huge amounts of diversity of the other crops that feed the world as well. So our story is one in which we domesticated, we spread as a species, farmers distributed seeds, Seeds were allowed to adapt, to, and the crops allowed to adapt as humans took these crops and spread them around the world. We have a food system that means it's possible to grow a fruit in a tropical part of the world and for it to be shipped uh, to uh, another part of the world, thousands of miles away, and be one of the cheapest foods in the supermarket. And we do that through monocultures. We do that by selecting a high-yielding variety and growing it on scale. So, for example, banana cultivation around the world on a scale in which you can fly over in an airplane and, and just watch this vast um, yeah, plantation 
of um, homogeneity unfold because bananas famously uh, are not grown from seed. They're grown from the suckers of individual banana plants, which means they are clonally propagated. They are genetically uniform. And, as you may already have heard as well, that this is making the banana an extremely vulnerable crop of the future. The reason being is we have one globally traded banana, the Cavendish, which was um, effectively selected in the, in the mid part of the 20th century. Um, and because it, it, it was high yielding and it could be transported uh, overseas. Um, but we extracted the fruit from the evolutionary battle with uh, fungal diseases, for example. And so the fungal diseases that exist in the wild that are in a, an arms race with um, the, the fruit in the wild, it, it, it could no longer resist the fungal diseases that have evolved and adapted. And so the predecessor of the Cavendish, the Gros Michel, that was effectively impossible to cultivate on a scale by the 1940s and 50s. We introduced the Cavendish, and now it's being overwhelmed by the same fungal disease. There are no monocultures in nature, and so what we are now doing is trying to um, find alternatives to the Cavendish because this monoculture is now uh, extremely fragile. But it's not just bananas. So wheat, um, we... Uh, again, have a very small selection now of varieties out of that um, the you know, two, 200,000 plus in Svalbard. We've bred from a very small gene pool, and so we have quite genetically uniform wheat that's being planted around the world globally, and no surprise. Nature is catching up with this uniformity and exposing its weaknesses. And um, FSB and BLAST are just in you know, terms of the, of the uh, farming sector to describe fungal diseases that are now costing farmers billions and billions of pounds and euros and dollars each year because disease, again, is exposing the weaknesses of, of monocultures and uniformity. And famously, as we've expanded these uh, monocultures, uh, we have taken farming further into uh, the reaches of, of natural biodiversity or wild um, uh, systems. And this is why people suspect uh, COVID has its origins in that interaction between the human curated land and also the, the wild biodiversity. And COVID is just one example in which we suspect that this is an interaction between the wild um, and the urban um, created a problem, but also back in 2000 in, in Malaysia, for example, the pig industry was pretty much destroyed because of expanding farms to, into tropical areas in which there were fruit bats that then contaminated the feed of the pigs, and it was a far more deadly virus than COVID. So the FAO believes that 75% of crop diversity has been lost in the last century. Um, we are, have been in, in sharp decline in the disappearance of the genetic diversity that's been created over thousands and thousands of years. And making that possible, or running in parallel, is the consolidation of food and farming and the various industries that underpin so much of what we eat. And so seeds, uh, which you know, one of the key foundations, really, of the food system, um, now mostly in the control of four, just four corporations. Half the world's cheeses uh, are made with the starter cultures, the bacteria, or the enzymes, the rennet, from one company based on the outskirts of Copenhagen. The genetics of the global pig industry all can be traced back to one breed of pig, with devastating consequences, by the way, back in 2017, 2018, when half the world's pig population was pretty much wiped out with African swine fever in China. And I mentioned the bananas, that 1,500 different types of bananas exist around the world, but we rely on just one, which is now fragile, vulnerable. None of this is new. So um, 100 years ago, there was a... Uh, the famous Russian botanist Nikolai Vavilov travelled across five continents. His adolescence was shaped by stories of famine in Russia. Go back a bit further, the Irish 
potato famine, the hunger in Ireland, in which the same potato, the lump of potato, was planted in the same soil year after year, and one of the reasons why a million people died and many more people, many more millions fled Ireland was because that crop failed. A fungal disease overwhelmed the potato crop. Vavilov was convinced that we needed to save diversity for the future of humanity, that so much was already disappearing, that we needed to save the seeds that had been planted by our ancestors. And so he traveled and he collected seeds. Um, we don't have time to go into his, his story, which I tell in the book, but uh, so inspired were the people who followed him, the, this, the scientists, the botanists, the other seed collectors, that when the collection of seeds that he'd put together in St. Petersburg was surrounded by the Nazis uh, during the siege of St. Petersburg, many of them were surrounded by seeds and foods that they could potentially eat, so the, for example, the rice collection. But they were so convinced that this was a resource for the future of humanity, many of them starved to death rather than eat those seeds. He inspired so many people um, around the world uh, that diversity matters. And, and in, a, in a sense, diversity was picked up by some of the scientists in the 1940s and 50s who were so concerned about future food hunger, including Norman Borlaug, who was working in Mexico, um, wanted poor farmers to have uh, better yields so they could make more money and have better food security. So he took some of the diversity that he, he could find around the, the wheat world, um, some of the um, wheat that was being grown in the Americas, but also, importantly, a dwarf wheat that had been um, found in Japan uh, during the occupation after the Second World War and created the modern wheats that are now mostly grown around the world today. So they are short dwarf wheats that can take up the um, industrial, uh, industrial synthetic fertilizers. Um, that it's important they're dwarf because it means they don't go, grow so tall that they fall over because they have so much grain. And also they can put more of their energy into producing the seeds that we then process and, and, and eat. But so successful was Borlaug in creating these modern dwarf wheats that they spread in first to um, across South Asia, so India, uh, Afghanistan uh, as well. And by the 1970s and 1980s, they were spreading through Europe as well. But um, you know, as we know, I mean, uh, Vavilov didn't just visit uh, Amsterdam. He also visited America uh, and interacted with botanists, including a guy called Harry Harlan. This is his son, Jack, who in the early 1970s wrote a scientific paper called The Genetics of Disaster. So as the green re so-called green revolution wheat that Borlaug and others were creating and rice, creating uniformity around the world, he wrote this scientific paper in which he said these resources, meaning the seeds, the kind of seeds that were stored by Vavilov and in seed banks around the world, the kind of diversity that was disappearing from farmers' fields, these resources stand between us and catastrophic starvation on a scale we cannot imagine. And so struck by those words was another American botanist uh, in the 1990s, a guy called Kerry Fowler. He was the person who persuaded, lobbied the Norwegian government to invest the money to create Svalbard as the seed vault, the so-called doomsday vault, to save the diversity that was disappearing from around the world. So you can see that connection between Vavilov and that amazing building and resource for the world, which contains the seeds, uh, I guess my ancestors created through thousands of years of farming and all, all of your ancestors as well. It's not just a collection uh, that just sits there. Um, I want to tell the story of one particular seed, possibly one of the more humble foods uh, you can imagine, which is a tiny lentil. Um, so the um, earliest farmers didn't just domesticate wheat. They uh, were responsible for the so-called Neolithic package, which contained wheat, barley, chickpeas, and lentils as well. These were the, some of the earliest domesticated foods that, that fed our ancestors and spread around the world and created huge amounts of diversity. And lentils, for example, arrived many, many thousands of years ago in southern Germany and adapted to these mountainous, quite rocky 
um, landscapes where it was difficult to grow other sources of, of food. But by the 1960s, um, Germany was industrializing, people were leaving these rural areas. Canada, interestingly, <laughs> became the world's number one lentil producer um, as, a, as a kind of a policy decision. So why grow these lentils in Germany when you can just buy in these, these uh, cheaper um, North American varieties grown on scale? This guy, uh, Walder Mammel, uh, a farmer, uh, disagreed. Uh, he mourned the loss of this humble lentil, thinking that it wasn't just a part of a farming system, a crop rotation system, that it disappeared, but also a way of life. And also there were lots of traditional you know, dishes, recipes that revolved around this very, very tasty, distinctive lentil. Visited, wrote to many, many seed banks around the world. Could not find anyone who had collected the the lentil um, decades ago in order to save it as Vavilov had done. But decided um, in the early 2000s with a group of other um, Swabian farmers to travel to the Vavilov Institute in St. Petersburg to see what they had. Perhaps they had something similar. And it turns out they actually did have the lentil. It had been um, recorded under the wrong name. They changed a few letters around. And so sitting there waiting for him was a lentil, and that's one of my favorite images is of him being reunited with his lentil. <laughs> it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful photo because it captures this, the end of this search in a way and, and how powerful that relationship with the most humble of foods, that connection. I mean, I envy him for having that such a strong connection with that farming and food history in Swabia. But there he is. And... This is living, this is a living tradition now because he inspired 200 other farmers in Swabia to start growing the lentils. His story then traveled to different parts of Europe. And in Sweden, there were young farmers who looked back through monastic records about what people were eating, these long, slow-cooked stews involving peas and beans that, could only, that were adapted to these quite, again, rough northern European conditions. And that Swedish story inspired some farmers in England to start looking back through our history. And it, it turns out that we were growing fava beans during the Iron Age. And they've set up a company. And so this is, you know, these are traditions that are living today and actually providing an income and, again, wonderful, delicious food of the future. So back to the Fertile Crescent, because I want to just turn from plants and cereals to animals and meat. Because not only in the Fertile Crescent was the... Uh, were our early farming ancestors uh, domesticating lentils and barley, but also cattle. As you can see, sheep, goats. There were two lines of domestication of the pig. One of them was in this region as well. <clears throat> and so these, these animals also were, ta were taken by early farmers and farmers through the millennia, and they adapted to different conditions, different temperatures, different al altitudes, different... Um, sources of food, huge amounts of genetic diversity was created. But way earlier than the Green Revolution in Britain, we had somebody who was on a mission to improve the productivity of livestock. And so Robert uh, Bakewell, a farmer in the Midlands in England, helped create a, a food system, uh, a, a way of uh, breeding animals to create bigger, more muscly, more meatier, more you know, sheep with more wool and so on through a very, very specific um, plan of, of uh, livestock breeding. This was the meat and the livestock that, that fueled the um, Industrial Revolution in Britain. But not only that, he set the course for, uh, for the 20th century in which we redesigned so many of the animals, the the dairy cattle, for example, that now make up 95% of the, the global dairy herd. The three genetic lines of poultry that now produce most of the world's chicken. These were all, I guess, the result of Bakewell's mission to design animals, or redesign animals, that could, I guess, fit our needs in our farming systems. And also that story of consolidation and concentration follows as well. So if you can see... Here, uh, I, let me just, I mean, the likes of Cargill, ADM, JBS, the, I guess the control of, of uh, meat 
production around the world is now falling into fewer and fewer hands. Interestingly, when you think about some of the alternative proteins that are now making their way onto the market and some of the novel um, technologies that are replacing meat, you see the similar players here who are obviously uh, investing in an alternative future. And somebody who has very little to do with food but actually comes from the world of physics and, 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 um, and somebody who's under, tried to kind of unravel the mysteries of networks, both man-made and, and natural, uh, is Albert Barabasi, who, who has a lab in Boston, doing amazing work, actually, to try and reveal the complexities of our food because we track around 150 chemical compounds in our food. He is finding ways in which we can unravel the, the secrets of the 26,000 other chemical compounds that you might find, say, in a carrot or garlic. Um, but also, he's somebody who's just reminding us that there is so much complexity we have lost in that story that I've described of the Green Revolution and that narrow selection of high-yielding but now fragile crops and animal breeds. Um, and you know, he, he, he talks about um, the fact that you know, we, we have been blessed by these technological scientific breakthroughs in many ways, but we haven't really understood the full consequences when we do so, which is why like a child taking apart a favourite toy, he says. We have no idea how to put it back together again. And in riding reductionism, we run into the hard wall of complexity, which is where I think we've arrived at, really, with this current food system. Uh, in, a, in the space of a few short decades, we have completely changed the way the, the world produces food, primarily through the Green Revolution and its legacy. We focused on uniformity. We allowed the world to become more homogenised in the way we food we farm and the food that we, we eat and, and process. But we are starting to see the consequences of that uniformity. And this is why the science is so exciting as well. Um, there are many examples I could give of new science revealing why we should care about this complexity, why food traditions aren't just relics of our history that belong in a food museum that they actually are extremely valuable resources. And so go, going back to what I was saying about the, the Hadza, through the seasons, uh, consuming 800, or uh, this potential menu of 800 different plant and animal species, what we are now understanding with the science of the gut microbiome, which these trillions of microbes that we all host, the more diverse our gut microbiomes, the more beneficial that is to our physical and mental health, the more diversity we consume, the better that is, the more diverse our gut microbiomes. We evolved with diversity, and we're now understanding, starting to understand the science as to why that really matters to our well-being. So we all have the most selfish of reasons to save and consume diversity. Uh, the other image, by the way, is a bog body that was uncovered uh, in Denmark in the 1950s, we, we think is around two, two and a half thousand years old. When they, when they, because of how well preserved these bodies are, and they thought it was a, a, mur a recent murder victim when they found the, the bog body, f more than 40 different seeds, or, or plants, 40 different plant varieties, the seeds were found in the stomach of, the, of, of, of this uh, uh, bog body. Um, yeah. So I end the book by saying we all need to well, we can't go back to being hunter-gatherers. We, we don't really have, we, we don't want to, we don't need to, but we can think like a Hadza. We can be far more in tune with where our food comes from, with the environments that produce our food, the nature that we actually depend on, which is exactly what the Hadza are acutely aware of. They know that if they pick too much, if they hunt too much, that they are overstepping a line uh, and they're damaging the biodiversity that they will depend on and future, de future generations will depend on. We need, in our future, to be thinking more like the Hadza, to be more in tune with our environment, with the ecosystems that we depend on for our food. Thank you. <laughs>